I'm also thrilled for the series that we're in called Holy Habits. And uh, Holy Habits, we are talking about the 12 disciplines of the Christian faith. And as you know, it's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to actually work at your relationship in God, right? The Bible says, to Paul told Timothy, that we should work our salvation out with fear and trembling. There should be an activeness to your faith. There should be um, this proactiveness to your faith where you're not just kind of like, oh, I believe in Jesus, and so I'm good. I'll just wait for the rapture or till I die and I go to heaven. That's not really what the Christian life is all about. We're supposed to be working at this. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And, uh, you know, God has some things that he wants to accomplish. In our uh, series, we've had this uh, key verse, which is 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. It says, do not waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, and here's the five words that we've been focusing on, train yourself to be godly. Five words, right? You thought it was Joyce Meyer's responsibility, right? You thought it was, you know... Uh, you know, Stephen Furtick, or you know, name your guy. Oh, you know, I get all my stuff from Craig Rochelle, right? It's not his responsibility for you to be trained in godliness. It's your responsibility to train yourself in godliness. It's not my responsibility. It's not your spouse's responsibility. It's your responsibility, and you need to take you need to take it seriously. And so, uh, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life as well as in the life to come. Okay. So we've covered four subjects already, four disciplines up to this point. We talked about reading scripture. So if you are a believer in Christ, one of the active things you can do is just get a hold of God's word every single day. Read one verse, read one chapter, read something, write one chapter, do something where you're engaging the life-giving message of the word of God. It's living, it's active. We covered that in week one. Week two, we talked about prayer and meditation. And so oftentimes we talk specifically about the idea that when we pray, we're usually doing all the talking and usually it's God, would you please, God, could you, God, please do this, please do that. Please. Like all we're doing is just giving God a grocery list. God, here we go. Please do all these things. And, and we thought, well, if God is the God of the universe, wouldn't it be more important to listen? Like listen to the voice of the Lord, what he has to say to me specifically and personally on this calendar day. As we talked about week two, week three was a challenging week because we talked about the spiritual discipline of fasting, the spiritual discipline of fasting and how fasting can really drive us deeper into our relationship with Jesus. And when you stop eating food or you stop going to your phone or say you're going to go off social media for seven days, you know, whatever that looks like for you, you're going to remove something that's going to cause you a little bit of pain so you can focus on the things of the Lord. That's fasting. And that was spiritual discipline number three on week three. Last week, we talked about the discipline of writing, of writing. And you can call this journaling or whatever. And we talked all about that last week. And we noted the fact that, you know, this entire book was literally uh, written because somebody took the time to discipline themselves to write this down. And we have all of these reflections, all of this power from antiquity, literally 4,000, 3,500, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, because somebody bothered to write it down and tell us the story, all the struggles, all the dirt, and all the successes and all of the game plans. And so you can do the same in your own life. Just write, journal every single day uh, what um, what God is doing in your life. So today, we're going to talk about the fifth discipline, and uh, we're going to talk about the discipline of rest and solitude and silence. And this is one of those things, right, that at first glance you're like, okay, sign me up. Like, I am in for the rest thing. But as I will talk about in this little story, um, yeah, sometimes we have trouble doing this, don't we? We have trouble shutting our mind up. We have trouble not being productive. As soon as we sit down on the couch somewhere, you know, it's kind of like, oh, shouldn't I be doing something? Shouldn't I be accomplishing something? When I was a kid, and if you are Pentecostal, you will get this all day long, because when I was a kid, there was there was only there was two services on a Sunday. There was one in the morning, and then there was one at 7 p.m. at night. And the, the one at 7 p.m. at night would sometimes go long, would sometimes go 9, 9.30, whatever. And if there was altar time or prayer afterwards, 
And so when I was a child, like 8, 9, 10, 11 years of age, I hated Sunday afternoon. Why? Because we'd go to church, and that was great, and then we'd come home, and we'd eat roast beef dinner, and it would be awesome. And so day is going so good, so far so good. And then my mom would say, okay, Robert, it's time to lay down for your afternoon nap. And I'm like, no, anything but the nap, mom. Like, hit me with anything. Make me do chores. Lay down in my bed at eight years old? Like, that is just mental. Like, no eight-year-old child wants to lay down and have an afternoon nap. Well, that's what we do on Sunday. We rest on Sunday. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, this is the, this is the worst punishment. I'm, like, I won't sleep. That's fine. Just lay down and rest. And then we get up. We'd have a little dinner. And then we would go off to, um, we would go off to church again on, uh, on Sunday night. So I feel like this is almost, as much as we like the idea of rest, this is almost a biblical thing um, that God needs for us to do. You remember Psalm 23, right? How does it start out? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Every, oh, everything is going great. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I'm like, all of a sudden, this is sounding like my mother, and I'm eight years old, and it's Sunday afternoon, and somebody is making me lie down in green pastures. It doesn't say he sleeps, but you get the idea. That there was this forcefulness to the Lord saying, there's a principle here that will refresh you, that will make you stronger if you lie down in green pastures. And at first blush, and I'm going to give you permission, by the way, in a little bit, to have guilt-free naps. Okay, so that's coming. But the deal is, it, it, it does, it sounds good at the beginning. But then all of a sudden, we think about trying to turn our minds off, right? And that's harder, you know, easier said than done. Because as soon as we lay down, we're like, well, I should be doing this, or I should be doing that, or I should get that done, or I have this whole to-do list, or my spouse wants me to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm supposed to be doing that. And so there's this, you know, we feel like we're going to be judged by others by our lack of busyness. We also feel judged by ourselves by our lack of productivity. And we also have these huge issues of self-reliance, because if I don't do that, then what's the fallout of that? What's going to happen? And so I want to show you a video clip um, that I think I'll describe it sort of before and after. I'll give you a little bit of context, but I want to just describe this, this video uh, for you because I think it speaks into the hearts and lives of where we're at in God because I don't think we're that great at resting. I don't think we're that great at uh, this biblical principle of the discipline of resting. And I hope it challenges you. The clip we're about to see is from a movie called The Sound of Metal. And uh, it tracks the life of a younger person who is the drummer in a really, really, really heavy rock band. And so if you can imagine the heaviest music that you know about, just multiply that times five. And then this is what this guy's involved in. Like, I mean, he's full out. He's just going, going to town. And what happens in the story early on is because he's abused his hearing for so many years, what ends up happening is in the middle of a concert, he just all of a sudden loses his hearing. And what he finds out during the course of the movie is it's not like a just a loss of hearing where it's just like, oh, you've heard an explosion and your you know, eardrums, you know, you know, this is a perforation. This is a complete disconnection. And he is now deaf. He has about 3% hearing. And so if you can think about how that would hit you and think about how it hit him as a rock drummer, and this is the thing he loves to do, this is uh, putting food on the table, and this is his source of income, and so forth, all of a sudden he is lost. And so he is, the movie just kind of tracks with him all of what he has to, uh, you know, kind of learn as a, now a deaf person. And, uh, and he really believes in this idea that when he gets cochlear implants, that that's going to solve all of his issues. Because he hears this way, oh, you can hear through your ear, but you can also hear through your skull, which a lot of people do hear a lot of stuff through their skull. And so he, he hears about these things called cochlear implants, where they literally screw into your skull and then have these uh, sort of listening devices that go into your ears. And through the miracle of science, you can actually hear some things. Well, of course, he thinks he's going to go to 100% hearing, 
and he thinks it's just going to all return and he can go back to his life as a, as a drummer. And what happens is he only goes to about 17% hearing. He can hear certain things and there's certain sounds, but everything is grainy and everything is gritty. Everything is distorted. And so he can kind of know where sounds are coming from, but it's hard for him to distinguish those sounds. And he is very distraught. He is, he's lost his relationship with his girlfriend, who's also in the band. He's lost his passion, which was drumming. He's lost his income and his livelihood. And he's kind of just lost. And so what you're going to see in this scene, and we'll describe it after, is the very, very end of the movie. So I hope you don't, if you've watched it, then you're good to go. But if not, this is a bit of a spoiler. But uh, I just want to discuss some of the things that he notices after he comes out from this scene. So there's a couple of observations that I want to make here. Number one has to do with what he was hearing at the beginning. Just that clambering, just really gritty and distorted, all of these sounds. And I really think that this is a bit of a metaphor for our lives. In our world, there's so much to take in. There's so many uh, messages that we get on a personal level. Texts coming in, emails coming in, phone calls coming in. Uh, there's so much to take in in terms of the news or in terms of things that we encounter on the internet or movies that we watch or the radio. And it seems like all the time we're just being bombarded with message after message after message. And after a while, you can't even see the forest for the trees. There's just this garble happening on a regular basis. The second thing that I, I thought was amazing was this, uh, that was just the, the, Dramatic difference in the sound of complete silence. And I love the fact that they just let that play out. And he's just kind of like all of a sudden seeing everything without the sound. And I feel like there's a fear for us. None of us want to be deaf, right? None of us want to be, you know, we want all of our five senses. Thank you very much as much as we can have of them. But, but the thing that I noticed was in that silence, all of a sudden, his perspective started to change. And the look on his face, and I might be reading too much into this, but the look on his face was one of, of sheer terror, right? He's like, this is my life now forever? And he's coming to grips with that. But he also, it seems like there is 
He could listen with all of this cacophony going on, or he could sit in the stillness and the silence. And in the stillness and the silence, I feel like there was this element of peace, right? That he just, I've never experienced. So there's also this discovery happening where he's just like, this is peace. I, I actually, I've been in this metal band, and now I'm like, what is, what is this strange thing called silence? And I, I almost kind of like it, and I'm almost like, what could my life be like if I can actually stop myself for that second to rest? And I really believe this is what God is calling us to do. Obviously, we have to find a balance. Um, we need to be listening. And so what, what does this balance look like? And uh, where do we find this? How do we get this? What's the precedent for this as a spiritual discipline? And so uh, I want to just zip through a couple of scriptures here that I think are very important. Because where we get our precedent for resting in God, it starts very early in the scripture. In fact, it starts very early as a principle in the creation story, i.e. the seventh day, and God rested. And you're like, God rested? Yeah, this is it. Genesis 2 and 3, it says, And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Now, God wasn't exhausted, right? He didn't need a breather. You know, God is, you know, omnipotent. He's all powerful. God doesn't need to take a nap, okay? What ends up happening is he creates all of creation and it is finished. He has ceased from his work and everything he's done is, um, is good. I mean, it's very good. And so what God does as the last act in his uh, chronology of creation is he sits down to take it all in and go, okay, this is good. He came to rest. It's kind of like he sat on his throne. It is good. It is done. He came to rest. And this becomes a precedent, right? Uh, for the children of Israel, because when they get released from exile, when they get um, released in the Exodus uh, out of uh, Egypt, we have the scripture here. One of the Ten Commandments says, remember to observe the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. And let's just stop right there for a second. I want to just mention two things. Number one is of all of these 12 disciplines that we're going to cover in the next number of weeks, this is the only one which God commands you to do. This is not a suggestion. This is in the Ten Commandments. So this is very, very significant, very, very important. Also, of the Ten Commandments, it's the only one which is proactive on your part, which you do as a spiritual discipline. There is no other spiritual disciplines in the Ten Commandments, right? Like, uh, you know, don't have any other gods before me. Right? Don't make for yourself any graven images. Okay, well, none of us are really doing that. You know, you kind of have to go to your way to like carve something and then worship it. Um, you know, don't murder, don't steal, right? Don't commit adultery, don't uh, bear false witness against your name. Like all of those things are kind of don't, 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 don't. But this one is remember. Because life is in the silence. Life is in the rest. And guess what? I actually exemplified this as well. I rested, and so you should too remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And we'll talk about those definitional words in just a second. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners that are living among you. It goes on to say in verse 11, for six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. This is the precedent. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. You know, if that wasn't enough, that it's chiseled in stone tablets and then given to the children of Israel as commandments, he actually doubles down on, in Exodus 23, and he goes, six days you do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so you and your ox and your donkey may rest. 
and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. He actually goes on to mention this again in Deuteronomy. So it's kind of like, you know, not getting it in, right? Not get, has to keep repeating himself. And that's what he does with this whole idea of the word remember. In Deuteronomy, he talks about when you're in the Sabbath, they reflect and contemplate on me that I brought you out of slavery into the land, into the promised land. So what does this practically mean? Well, let's go back to verse 8 and the verse that we actually talked about. Because these words here, there's a lot of words in this sense that we don't use or even maybe understand, right? Like, I don't use the word Sabbath very much. Do you? I don't know, unless I'm talking to a religious friend. If you ever use the word Sabbath to somebody who doesn't know God or doesn't know the Bible, they would just be like, did you have a seizure? Because I don't really know what word you just used. And the other word is holy. Right? And I think about this in the old King James, right? Uh, remember the Sabbath day to, to keep it holy. And you're kind of like, oh, legalistic or what? Right? Like, I, I feel like, you know, I'm going to get a spanking if I don't do this. If you don't lay down, Robert, for your dad. We, like, it's legalistic. It's, it's uh, you know, has to be done. When I think about this Sabbath and this word holy, I think about people in robes. I think about old school. I think about people lighting candles. I think about tradition, right? I think about old school English. And you're kind of like, how does that connect to where I am today? Because I certainly don't want to go at this from a legalistic standpoint. So the first word that you have to have here is remember, which is one of the reasons God puts it in there, because we forget. Because we forget. We, we tend to get undisciplined about it. And so that's why God mentions it in the Ten Commandments, but also several more times. The Jewish people actually really dialed into this one. And even to this point, Orthodox Jews won't touch an elevator button on a Sabbath day because it basically is creating fire. And God said, don't create fire on the Sabbath day. And on and on and on. All these fence laws because they never wanted to offend God. I love their passion. I think they're missing the point. The point isn't don't touch an elevator button. The point is rest. The point is silence. The point is reflection. On God. The point is taking a deep breath and allowing the silence to fill your soul and allow you to recreate yourself so you're not just constantly listening to all this garbled, garbled goot out there. So remember to observe. No, go back one, Jen, please. So remember to observe, which obviously we have to, you know, look into the Sabbath. So there's this uh, observe. You can look at something or you can observe. Observe is a lot more proactive. You're actually pushing into it and you're kind of like, Okay, what, what does this actually look like? What does this mean for me? There's this observation, and then the Sabbath day. Now, Jewish people in their tradition would, would that day would mean from Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown. That's their 24 hour period. Uh, for Christians, because of Constantine, now we're kind of Sunday is the day of rest, you know? Um, and so, but Paul clears this all up and he says it doesn't really matter what day you choose, just choose the day. Okay? So, we can clear that up and you can talk to me after if you want to kind of go into that. Um, and then keeping, nope, Jen, your itchy trigger finger. <laughs> so by keeping it holy, again, we don't use the word holy. What does the word holy mean? Does it mean men in robes with ornate gold and a big altar and a pipe organ? Is that what holy means? Because some people think that means holy. Holy means set apart. That's all it means. It has nothing to do with pipe organs candles, any of that stuff. It means set apart. So the idea here is one day a week, you should live differently. One day a week, dinner should look differently. One day a week, your activity should look different. One day a week, you should spend a little bit more time contemplating. One day a week, which is a good discipline, why don't you attend church? Why don't you get in a community of believers and fill your heart and soul that way with the word of God, with the community of Christ, with the singing of worship? Sunday or one day should be different than all the rest. That's what holy means, separate, okay? So with that uh, being said, I wanna give you four steps, and Jen, you can put this up here. Four things. Sorry about the uh, spelling error there. Should be F-O-U-R, four things to include in a 24-hour Sabbath period. 
So here's what I want you to do. Whatever this looks like for you, you're supposed to train yourself for godliness. You're all in different stages of life. You all have different um, different lives and activity levels in, in life and all that kind of stuff. But the four things that you should do that I took from Peter Scazzaro's book called The um, Emotionally Healthy Leader, and he says the first thing you should do is stop. The first thing you should do is stop. So he would say, stop from all work, whether paid or unpaid. So again, whatever that looks like to you, there needs to be a stopping. With God in creation, he stopped creating. That's the precedent. Number two is you need to rest. And this is what I'm talking about. You know, guilt-free naps, like for days. Like, I don't know about you, but this afternoon I will go home and I will crash hard. And it's going to be amazing. And you wake up and you can... You almost can't even stand, you're a little dizzy, right? You got drool coming down, hair's all up like this, and you're just like, that's a Sunday nap. Like, if I could go back as my eight-year-old self, I'd be like, bro, just get into it, man. Like, like do this, dive in, get that pillow, like, just get the covers up, like, go hardcore on this napping bit, because it's good. You know, but these are guilt-free naps, because you kind of like, you sit down on the couch. Some of you ladies, you gotta sit down. Well, there's nothing for I have to do. Just do the dusting, and I have to get around and make sure. And I gotta get that out of the freezer. I'm gonna do some baking because the kids are coming. Home. Like, just relax. Just rest. Rest. And guys, I don't know. Stop watching football. I don't. Um, it's this. It's this idea of just absolutely becoming refreshed by rest. The third thing is delight, and I love that Skizero adds this. Because again, most people see this whole, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy as this legalistic traditional thing. Really, I think the world takes a little bit of a better view on this because those guys are the ones that work their butts off for six days and then on the seventh day they have their hobbies, they go cycling, they go running, they go fishing, they go to the cottage, they go whatever, and they rest, they play hard, rest hard. I think this is a biblical principle. And this is what we should, so what do you delight in? Do you like painting? Do you like writing? Do you like riding your bike? Do you, what, do you like hiking? What is it that you like? Do that, but find God in it, right? You know, the Jewish people, they love to eat. I don't know any people group that doesn't like to eat, but they love to eat. And so every Saturday, Friday night, they put on this huge spread. It's like Thanksgiving dinner every week. Why? Because they're celebrating that they're going to be resting. So they make this big, lavish meal, and they sit around. They delight in one another's company, the taste of good food. They light a candle to signify it's starting, and now we're going to rest. They take delight in it. And so often for us, everything is a drudgery. Everything is mundane. And on the Sabbath day, it should be the one day where we're, like, connecting with our friends or we're going to, you know, sit outside and take in the trees because we're going to push into this thing called Sabbath. And then the fourth thing is to contemplate God, which is to go to church, read extra scripture, meditate, um, allow your mind to focus on God, stop, and uh, reflect on God. You know, there's this amazing verse in scripture, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And it says, this is the words of Jesus. And he says, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, I will give you rest. And you know, it dawned on me this week that I think this is the, I always, I've always thought this is the newbie verse, right? This is the verse that we attract people to Jesus with, because people are out there in the world and they're doing this thing, and it doesn't dawn on them that there's, uh, that Jesus can come and, and Jesus can give them rest. They're feeling guilty. They're feeling shame. They're feeling all this confusion of a life that they've led that's just been anything but honoring to God. And so they have all of these fires that they're trying to put out, and they are so burdened. And so then this is, come to me, all you who are burdened, and I have all these fires and things going on. I will give you rest. I'll put those fires out. And people are like, oh yeah, sign me up for that. I want to accept Jesus. The thing that got me this week is all. Oh, and so my point is here, is I don't care if you've been serving Jesus for 50 years, for 60 years. You might actually be in the position where you are weary and heavy laden. Why? Because you're so self-reliant, you're trying to do it all on your own. 
And what's that next part of that verse say, right? Take my yoke upon you, right? The idea is, is that Jesus is saying, don't do it alone. Let's team up together. This is not a newbie verse. This is a verse for all of us who've been trying so hard for so long to do it on our own and without rest. And Jesus is like, no, you know what? Come my way, you know, implement the laws that I have instituted. And when you do, it's going to be a whole lot easier. Your life is going to be a whole lot fuller, but you're the one that has to take out those cochlear implants and find the silence. If you don't, it's just gonna sound like everything else. It's just gonna be this gritty, grainy, garbly goop, distorted sounds, unless we take time to stop, to stop and rest. In his book, Schizero, The Emotionally Healthy Leader, he he's talking specifically about leaders. And he talks about this connection between leaders in the secular world versus leaders in the church world. And he goes, you know, like all these leaders in the church world are just as much workaholics as the leaders in the secular world. He's like, I don't get that. Like, don't they understand the principle? And he said, don't you understand why? Because this guy was a psychologist. He goes, no, I don't understand why. He goes, they can't stop. Because if they stop, they'll have to listen. And the one thing they fear is what they might hear, right? We fear that so much if we're not productive, if we're not inputting information, if we're not, and it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. When we stop, God can start depositing in our spirits. God can start whispering into our hearts. You're my son, you're my daughter, you're worthy. You're a human being, not a human doing. I love you. But those words only come through when we cancel out all the other noise. By the way, if you are, uh, you know, of a certain age and you're retired, you know, my dad said I retired and I never knew I was going to be so busy in retirement. <laughs> he says, I'm actually busier now in retirement than I was when I was working a 40 hour job and I had 12 hours of commuting. Um, but even if you feel like, hey, my day, is um, like every day just kind of rolls into the next and I do the same thing day over day. I think what God is asking you to do is to push into this idea of delight. Delight, you know, you can delight in your kids, delight in your grandkids, delight in their futures and push into that even on these days. Set one day aside and say, that's the day that I'm gonna invest in the future of these kids. So I pray that you, I pray that you would embrace this discipline this week and, and start to kind of navigate through and think through how am I going to implement this? What kind of container am I going to put this in? Because I really see the value in this idea of rest, silence, and solitude. And I think, actually I don't think, I know because God has promised that he will bless you as you step into